Hi, and welcome. I am very excited to have Chris Kresser with me today. He is a licensed acupuncturist and functional medicine practitioner who focuses on ancestral health. He's also a New York Times bestselling author and the creator of the Adapt Practitioner and Health Coach Training Programs. Chris, thank you so much for being on the Wellbe Show and podcast with me today. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So I was very excited that we were able to record this interview because you have a very interesting story yourself and an interesting focus. So first things first, I'm sure a lot of people who just heard me say your introduction are wondering, what is ancestral health? Can you explain what that is and also how you came to focus on it and how it shaped your work? Ancestral health is a concept that comes out of evolutionary biology and the understanding that all life forms, you know, from human beings down to the uh, simplest single celled organism evolved in a particular environment. And because of that adapted to survive in that environment. So if you think of just like, again, like a simple bacteria, living deep in the ocean, close to hydrothermal vents, they've evolved certain uh, survival mechanisms that allow them to thrive in that environment. And if you take that bacteria and drop it in a shallow tide pool, it's gonna die because it doesn't, it's not adapted for that environment. And, uh, you know, we see this also like in, uh, in animals who are, live in the wild and then, um, you know, go into a zoo, if they start being fed a different diet and they're living a totally different way than they would live in the wild then their health suffers. And it turns out that the same thing is true for human beings. We evolved in primarily an outdoor environment. You know, we lived outside. We uh, were physically active through most of, most of the day. You know, we walked an average of 10 to 15,000 steps a day. That activity was punctuated by brief periods more intense physical activity like chasing prey or, you know, defending our territory or something like that, you know, lifting heavy things, building shelters, et cetera. Uh, we ate primarily meat, fish, wild fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and some starchy plants that we were able to gather. Um, there was a, obviously no processed and refined foods at that point. We lived in, in rhythm with the natural cycles of light and dark. So, you know, we woke up when the sun came up and we went to bed not too long after the sun went down. We lived in close-knit tribal social groups. That's very much part of our genetic heritage as, as human beings. And not surprisingly, all of those factors are, you know, what make us healthy and well, because that's the environment that we evolved in. And, and today, in the modern industrial world that we live in, um, there's a tremendous mismatch between the, the diet and lifestyle that we're eating and living today and the way that our genes and our biology are designed to run. And so that's this concept of ancestral health. And the idea is not that we eschew all modern life and, you know, put on a loincloth and, you know, live in a cave. And that's ridiculous and not possible or desirable for virtually everybody. But there are ways that we can adapt our modern lives to be in closer alignment with what our genes and our biology are, are programmed for. So we can certainly eat more of a whole foods diet we can adjust our lifestyle so that we're more in sync with the natural rhythms of light and dark with things like reducing our screen use at night. And, you know, there are even glasses you can wear that will reduce the exposure to blue light. Um, we can be physically active more throughout the day using things like standing desks, which I'm doing right now, um, or even treadmill desks or, you know, bikes that you put under the desk that you can pedal while you're working. You know, we can, uh, make an effort to have more social connection. So there's lots of ways that we can adapt our lives to be more in alignment with that ancestral approach. I love that. I didn't realize you're standing right now. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have at this point heard the word paleo, which is in the same idea or references the same you know, era of human history. It makes a lot of sense to me. The only thing that I've ever heard as people's you know, objection or something to trying to understand what we did then and how we can adapt 
you know, this modern lifestyle, which encourages chronic disease to be more like it is, didn't they die early? You know, why would we want to do that? Uh, so yeah. what do you say when people say that? Yeah, that's a pretty common argument. And um, it's there's some truth to it, but it, there's also a lot of misunderstanding. It's true that our ancestors had shorter lifespans than we did on average, but those averages were dragged down by very high rates of you know, mortality early in life. And that was primarily due to a complete lack of emergency medical care. So if you're living outdoors, you live in a pretty hostile environment, you know, you can you're susceptible to you know, severe weather events, you know, in a hunter-gatherer type of environment, you have threats from other people who want the resources that you have. So there's, a de you know, deaths due to warfare and violence um, and trauma, you know, accidents. All of us take it for granted that we can just go to the urgent care or hospital if something like that happens. But obviously our ancestors uh, couldn't do that. And same for infant mortality. You know, if there was a problem with birth, there was nothing that could, could be done. So those deaths, you know, very early in life dragged down the average lifespan. But what anthropologists have found who studied um, extant hunter-gatherer cultures is that if people survive the threats of, of childhood and early life, they actually live lifespans that are equivalent to our own in the industrialized world. Or if they have access to even the most rudimentary emergency medical care. So imagine like a very rural medical clinic that you know, a hunter-gatherer group would have to walk a half day to get to. But if they, if they even have access to that, they also live lifespans that are equivalent to our own. But the difference is they reach those older ages without acquiring all of the chronic inflammatory diseases that we acquire not only in our old age, but now increasingly even in our middle age and younger years, you have kids as young as eight years old being diagnosed with type two diabetes now, which is just shocking and horrific. Um, so they not only live equivalent lifespans, but they, they have a much longer health span as we call it, which is the portion of your full lifespan that you are healthy and well. You know, most of us, if we were told that we could live, you know, an extra 10 or 15 years, but we'd be in a wheelchair and a diaper that entire time, you know, maybe that's not so appealing. Uh, w whereas if we can live our, that full lifespan and be completely healthy and vital, uh, you know, mostly up until the end, then that's, that's what we're shooting for. Absolutely. I, I somehow I've never heard that term health span, but that's what I talk about constantly. Um, so you just gave me a total layup for what the focus of this interview is, which is um, detoxification. So basically what you're describing as far as the hunter gatherer period and ancestral health, they were not, no matter what age they died, they were not dealing with the chronic diseases that we have today. Um, as you said, so many different age groups and it's pervasive. Basically wherever Western and industrialized food and society goes in the world, di chronic disease and chronic, you know, symptoms too, because a lot of people don't think they have a chronic disease, but they just get migraines or something like that. But they're all the same thing to me yeah. goes as well. So do our bodies do detoxification on their own or can they detoxify on their own? And do we need any detoxification activities? First, can you explain some of the natural pathways that our bodies have for helping us detox and how these processes work? Because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion and controversy around the idea of detoxification and do we really need it? And, and I hope you could um, clear this up for my audience. Absolutely, our bodies do perform detoxification on their own. Um, that was also part of our natural evolutionary heritage. So, you know, there were times in a natural environment, let's say we ate something that was rotten or toxic, you know, we had to have some way of eliminating those toxins. Um, from the body and so that is a natural part of our heritage um, those routes are primarily through feces uh, urine and sweat that are the the primary routes of detoxification the organ systems that are mostly involved there would be the the liver the gallbladder the digestive tract and the kidneys and also the skin that's how sweat gets out most people don't think of the skin as an organ but it's actually the largest organ in the body uh, and it's very important organ when it comes to detoxification. If we talk more about saunas later, um, sweat, 
you know, becomes a very important route of detoxification and that, you know, with, with sauna use. And that's one of the, one of the reasons that sauna is important for, for detox. The problem is that although we do have natural detox capacity, that capacity evolved during a time when the toxic burden was far, far lower. So we again, go back to this idea of ancestral health in our ancestral environment we didn't have exposure to massive amounts of heavy metals like lead and mercury uh, through you know, industrial contamination or cadmium or arsenic. There's naturally occurring arsenic in some foods, um, but you know, the amounts that we would have been exposed to are nothing like what we're exposed to today. We didn't have pesticide and herbicide exposure, things like glyphosate. We didn't have industrial chemicals like um, flame retardants and the chemicals that come from jet fuel. We didn't have um, indoor mold and other biotoxins that form when living uh, in indoor environments. Of course, there are outdoor molds, but they don't have the same impact on our health uh, because they're dispersed. You know, you're living in an outdoor environment that spreads around in the air and, and those molds actually often tend to be different as well. So we didn't have the massive toxic burden uh, that we have today. And so our natural detox mechanisms did not evolve to deal with the toxic burden that we're facing today. And evolution is not fast. So our genes and our you know, physiological systems cannot change quickly enough to keep up with the massively growing toxic burden that we're experiencing. So that's one of the main issues is that, you know, if you, if you, if we consider what determines whether somebody detoxes appropriately, one of the main factors is the burden of toxins that they're exposed to. And the higher that burden is, the harder the detox system will have to work and the less likely it is that it will be able to perform as well as it, it needs to in order to clear all the toxins out of the body. The other factors that are important are how competent is that individual's detox system. And you see a lot of variation here based on genetics, epigenetics, which is the expression of genes, um, nutrient intake, because our detox system depends on many different nutrients that we get through the diet. And because of the shift away from a nutrient dense diet that was our ancestral diet to a, a modern, you know, highly refined processed food diet that is nutrient poor, a lot of people just aren't getting enough of the nutrients that they need in order to detoxify effectively. And then you have what we could call anti-nutrients, you know, the, the sugar and the processed and refined foods and the chemicals that are actually toxins in the diet that put additional stress on the detox system. Um, and then you have things like chronic stress, which, you know, slows down uh, the detox system, physical inactivity, uh, lack of exposure to natural light, like all of the other aspects of the modern lifestyle that compromise detox pathways. So when you put all of that together, it leads to the unfortunate conclusion that a lot of us are probably not detoxing in an optimal way. And therefore, even though we do have a natural ability, some innate natural ability to do that because of the toxic burden and because of our own individual and, and societal threats that, that compromise detox, many of us probably need a little bit of additional support or a lot of additional support in some cases. You just brought up two things that I wanted to ask you about. Epigenetics and genetics are a whole giant topic we could talk about for hours, you know, in and of themselves. But related to detox, how do our genes impact our ability to detox fully or detox properly? Well, there are several genes that are important in the detox process. And these include genes that are related to methylation, which is part of the detoxification process like MTHFR, which a lot of people have heard of. Genes uh, related to uh, the, the brain like BDNF, COMT. It's probably safe to say that the list of genes that are involved in detox is a lot longer than the list of genes that is not that are not <laughs> involved in detox. Okay. So there can be changes uh, or polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, which are changes to 
the structure of that of of those genes that then ex- affect how those genes express, and then through that they affect the function of those genes. So, let's say somebody has two copies of mutation of the MTHFR gene, then they're going to have issues with um, folate metabolism, which is B9. And folate is very important for the methylation cycle, which is, which is important in detoxification. So different genetic haplotypes can predispose people to having problems with detoxification. But I don't actually think that's the biggest issue. Um, I think too much emphasis has been put on the clinical significance of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And, you know, I see people getting genetic tests and then taking like shopping bags full of supplements just based on the, the, the results of those tests alone. And that's not really supported by the scientific literature at this point. There's a lot of recent research that suggests that while genes play some role in influencing our ability to detox, it's a relatively small role. And environment is a much, much bigger contributor. So by environment, I mean what we eat, how we exercise, how we manage our stress, how much we sleep. All of those things probably contribute about 90% of how effective our detox is versus maybe 10% of contribution from our genes. That's what most of us need to be thinking about the environment and not the genes, especially because genes are not modifiable. <laughs> so, you know, we've got the genes that we have. So the best thing to do is to focus on the environment. Friends of mine who know I'm, you know, somewhat into or knowledgeable about things like this and finally go and see a functional or integrative medicine doctor practitioner. And somehow in that conversation, either they sort of don't want to hear it or it's not explained to them. They leave with a giant bag of supplements and don't pay that much attention to everything else that they're doing. And so I'm kind of like, all right, well, you're just substituting over the counter and prescription drugs for this big bag of supplements. Meanwhile, your toxic burden isn't lessening at all because you're still Mm -hmm. using the same products on your skin and in your home and eating the same things and not doing the things that we know um, can support more detoxification. So it was funny that you said that. There are actually even computer, uh, you know, web-based algorithms that you can input your your genetic results into, and they will literally generate a list of supplements um, that you should take based on those results. And it's kind of ridiculous because you see someone has a mutation that, let's just say, it increases their need for folate. And then they've got another mutation that decreases their need for folate. And the algorithm's not smart enough to deal with that. So it'll, it'll make conflicting recommendations where it'll say, you know, take folate next to the one mutation and then next to the other one, it will say avoid folate. <laughs> and so I think this comes out of a, this era of genetic determinism, like right after we sequenced the human genome uh, back in the 90, early 90s, the, the thinking was, this is going to solve chronic illness. Like, this is the key to human health and disease. And now that we have this information, we're never going to deal with sickness again. That literally was the thinking at that time. And um, it turns out that that has been not at all uh, what has happened. I mean, it's certainly been useful and helpful to understand the, the human genome. But what we have ended up with, as I said before, in the case of detox, but this is true for most chronic illness. There are certainly some illnesses or diseases like cystic fibrosis that are strongly genetically determined, but chronic illnesses that most people die from, like heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, genes play a relatively small role and environment plays the, the lion's share of the role. You mentioned that genes are one thing that can either provide somebody with a good ability to fully detox or properly detox their bodies. Um, And then there are, you know, other things that actually can increase your toxic burden. But are there other things that we haven't spoken about um, besides genes that can actually harm somebody's, you know, natural ability to detox? You know, diet and nutrient intake is critical. Um, The overall amount of toxic burden is so the more toxins you have on board, the more difficult that it's going to be to do that. Um, Certain toxins are more difficult to clear than others. Uh, Lack of exercise, lack of sleep, uh, poor stress management, 
all of those things are really critical to detoxification. So if you're, if you're not doing a good job in those areas and you're not going to detox as well as you could otherwise. And then there are certain chronic diseases that would compromise detoxability. So anything that affects the digestive tract, for example, since that's one of the main routes of elimination, if you have you know, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or any other you know, chronic GI condition, that could be a problem. If you have liver disease, that's going to impact detoxification because the liver is one of the primary routes. And same thing with the gallbladder or the kidneys. If you have someone is diabetic and has chronic kidney disease, then their detox is likely going to be impaired. So anything that impacts the whole, that system, whether nutritional or lifestyle or you know, health status related will, will make a difference. As you were listing them, I just thought of two more that based on what you, you know, told us initially about how we detoxify, which is not drinking enough water, right? Because mm -hmm. then you're not getting out enough in your urine yeah, and, and yeah. your sweat. And then also, I guess, wearing antiperspirant, right? Because, I mean, you may sweat other places, but that's one of the major places that yeah. sweat comes out. The antiperspirant usually contains aluminum products and aluminum actually is talk can be toxic and and right. has been linked to alzheimer's and so that's kind of a double whammy yeah the water is interesting i mean you i don't subscribe to the the theory that we need to drink massive massive amounts of water i mean there, there's there's some of that around that we need to drink gallons of water every day in order to function properly. I don't think that's the case, but certainly dehydration and not enough water is going to be a problem, not only for the reason that you mentioned, because urine is one of the primary routes of elimination, but just that dehydration compromises our function in lots of other different ways that can impair uh, detox. So definitely right. important to drink enough water. And especially if you're doing things like sauna where, where you're sweating more, or you're exercising vigorously, or you're doing any kind of detox protocol, with a practitioner or on your own, drinking more water than you typically would would be helpful in those circumstances. I'm laughing about your, you know, not subscribing to the gallons and gallons of water because I know people who say that too. And the ancestral health, you know, perspective makes a lot of sense to me. And my answer to them, you know, even though I know we need to drink a lot more than most people are normally drinking, my answer to them is you think that you know, hunter gatherers were able to access gallons and gallons and gallons of water. You know, they're on the go. They, they like didn't they're have lucky. their clean canteen that they were carrying around. Exactly. Them, right? Like they're going to have it throughout the day, but they're not having it in these like large quantities all the time. So I don't think that's really the answer. Um, so that's funny that you said that. So basically, you know, chronic disease, chronic illness, chronic health issues, it's hard for a lot of people to imagine or picture the connection between your body just ridding itself of these toxins, you know, via feces, sweat, and urine, and then how you might end up with heart disease or something like that, for example. So would you mind just painting a little bit of a picture of kind of when this bucket spills over as far as your toxic burden and becomes an actual chronic health issue? I know each health issue is different, but what's kind of happening in the body that makes that, makes that occur? Yeah, I mean, it, it does really depend on what the toxin is and what the disease is. Um, but, you know, we can talk about uh, heavy metals and let's say Parkinson's disease. So that's, you know, there's been a very clear link now established between heavy metals and other toxins and Parkinson's. And I'm not just talking about in the functional and integrative medicine worlds. I'm talking about in just the completely conventional view uh, of Parkinson's. And it may be that that hasn't trickled down to the average primary care provider yet, but you can go to Harvard's website or any kind of conventional institution, medical uh, school institution website and, and see articles about this link between toxins and Parkinson's disease. And the reason for that is that many toxins are neurotoxins, which means that they preferentially affect the, the neurological system, the nervous system, and the brain. And so, you know, Parkinson's is obviously a neurological disease, and it makes sense that it, exposure to things like pesticides, which are fat-soluble compounds that can cross the blood-brain barrier, and heavy metals that can do that as well, um, may adversely impact the brain and the nervous system. So if you we just think about pesticides, they bind to a specific protein that's affected in Parkinson's disease called uh, alpha-synuclein. 
And the, the buildup of that protein, in addition to oxidative stress that's caused by the toxic exposure, is thought to be a causative factor for Parkinson's disease. So that's a direct link between pesticides and uh, a condition like Parkinson's. Then, you know, there's like uh, lead. I'm sure a lot of people, lead got on people's radar um, back during the Flint, Michigan water uh, crisis where there was, it was found that there was so much lead in the water. We know that it causes significant neuro de neurodevelopmental problems in children that can become permanent uh, if they're exposed to lead, enough lead or for a long enough period of time. But lead has also been linked to um, an increase in cardiovascular disease in adults. So we don't fully understand why that is, but lead can be stored in the bone. And then as the bone remodels itself, the lead can be released back into the bloodstream. Um, and because of its effect on the nervous system and the cardiovascular system, it's been shown to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, mercury exposure has been shown to increase the risk of Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid gland. So mercury is stored uh, in the thyroid gland. Then once it's stored there, it can increase the production of thyroid antibodies, which is what th causes the autoimmune impact, you know, the body breaking down the thyroid tissue. It also reduces the conversion of T4 to T3, which is T3 is the most active form of thyroid hormone. Um, so there are many different mechanisms, some of which are understood and well-established and others that are probably not yet, um, but we know enough already to know both to establish the links between these toxins and the diseases and to even understand how they cause these problems, at least to some degree. That was so interesting. I loved hearing just each one and how they're affect, especially the Parkinson's. You talked about the things that people can do every day that help to um, increase their detoxification and also to reduce their toxic burden, which are sort of an inverse relationship, right? Like when you do one, it helps the other and vice versa. Um, but are there additional things that maybe even hunter gatherers and you know our, our ancient ancestors were doing themselves that we didn't know about um, or that you know people are doing today that can really aid in this detoxification process or at least just speed it up if you have a chronic health issue or something that you're trying to really you know get your body to be rid of or you just found out you had high mercury levels and you're you know you want to do more than just reduce how much fish you're eating or something like that you really want to get it out um, what are some of the the best ways I think the basics are always the the most important place to focus and a lot of people like to your point earlier about your friends who have all these supplements, but they're not even just doing the basic stuff like eating a healthy diet or sleeping enough. Like that's the biggest mistake, frankly, that people make in my experience as a clinician for over 10 years. I think it's easy to like chase the shiny objects and get really interested in like, you know, supplements and like, uh, you know, more kind of advanced biohacking type of strategies and, and not pay enough attention to the core basics that actually are going to make the biggest difference. So for me, that's diet, like, if we think of the four pillars, that would be diet and nutrition, you know, nutrition intake, um, sleep, stress management, and physical activity. Most people that I know have a ways to go in at least one of those areas, if not more. So, you know, I might have a patient who has their diet completely dialed in and to the point where it's almost too dialed in. <laughs> they're maybe a little obsessive about it. Um, and maybe they're great with exercise, but they don't sleep enough. You know, they're sleeping six hours or fewer per night and they don't do anything to manage their stress. And that's, that's just kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you can do those other two things really well and that will help. But if you're not paying any attention to stress management and sleep, you're gonna really unwind a lot of the gains that you make from paying so much attention to physical activity and, and diet. So I always actually tell people to try to identify the weakest link in that chain and, and put their energy there first. Um, because they'll generally get more return on that investment than going from having like a 90% perfect diet to a 95% <laughs> 
perfect diet. Way better to, if your sleep is at like 20%, it's way better to bring that up to 50 or 60 or 70% than it is to get five more percent out of the, the diet. So, you know, nutrient dense diet is probably number one because all of those nutrients, like I said, are what we need for to support healthy detoxification. And most people just aren't getting enough. So that would be critical. Uh, exercise is also critical because that gets the blood and the lymph flowing. It, it causes sweat in many cases and just upregulates all of the pr processes involved in detoxification. Sleep is critical because that's where our tissue regenerates and repairs and we go and, and we engage those detoxification processes. And then stress management is critical because uh, when we're in the fight or flight response, the, the body prioritizes all of the systems that are required for immediate short-term survival. And that does not include detoxification. <laughs> Your body doesn't care about detoxification if you're in a fight or flight response because biologically, it's just prioritizing you know, blood flow to the skeletal muscles and oxygenation, mental clarity, and, you know, eyesight acuity, and everything that would help you to fight or flee. <laughs> Uh, in that moment. It doesn't care about digestion. It doesn't care about your endocrine system and hormones. It doesn't care about reproductive systems. It doesn't care about detoxification in those moments. So all of those four things are the most important. If those are dialed in beyond that, it's hard to say what our hunter gatherers knew or didn't, you know, ancestors knew or didn't know about detoxification, right? I, I certainly don't think they conceived of it in the way that we talk about it scientifically, but there's a long history of medicinal herb botanical use in, in traditional cultures. Uh, and, and some of those botanicals like milk thistle, for example, dandelion, et cetera, are, are useful for detoxification. So I'm certain that, you know, uh, traditional cultures use those kinds of things to help with, with detox. Heat exposure may or may not have been something that was known to be beneficial in our distant past, but certainly there's a long history of sauna use in Eastern European cultures in Finland and Russia. Um, that's been a part of culture for, for quite a long time. Um, so there was some awareness of how heat and sweat um, improved health, whether they thought about it as detoxification or not. Uh, and I think today still, both of those like certain botanicals and nutrients uh, that you can add and supplement to your diet and um, sauna are still two of the best methods for boosting your detox above and beyond what you can get with focusing on those four main areas. There were a few things you said there that I hadn't heard before and I loved and wanted to go back to. So focus on the thing you're doing the worst in. Um, mm -hmm. you know, because taking a diet from 90 to 95 for, and, and still sleeping poorly or still being dehydrated or whatever, I love that because I don't necessarily do that in my own life, but you're absolutely right. I sort of, I find a way to get all these other pieces better while leaving, let's say exercise, like still pretty subpar. Um, whereas I should, you know, I, I just focus my efforts on that. My diet would still be just as good. And, you know, I, that's natural. We tend to put our energy where we feel where it's familiar and comfortable and where we are successful. It's more difficult and painful to focus in areas where we feel less successful, less familiar, less adept. So um, that's, yeah, that's one of the, I think the most important things to do from this health improvement perspective. I also wanted to mention tea because that was sort of a, a combination of the warmth, the heat that you were talking about, and then these herbs. I know there are certain, you know, dandelion root tea and milk thistle tea we have at home. So that's something kind of easy and everyday and cheap that I think, you know, hits at both this warmth heat that you were talking mm -hmm. about, which aids detoxification as well as these uh, botanical herbs that are known to really support the liver and detoxification process. One little like caveat question I had, are there different detoxification methods that are better for different chronic symptoms or diseases? Or is it just generally your body has one detoxification process and no matter what you've got going on, you just want to support that process? No, I would say there are different methods that are appropriate in different circumstances. It's probably more relevant with different types of toxins. So, you know, the method for detoxifying heavy metals might be slightly different, like in our clinic, than detoxifying organic, persistent organic pollutants like 
pesticides, even different metals sometimes require slightly different approaches like thallium doesn't tend to respond well to some of the methods that other metals like mercury and lead might respond well to. Um, so I think how a detox protocol would be individualized depends on the type of toxin we're talking about. Mold is a whole different story. And then secondarily might also depend on the, the condition. Um, so certain people, for example, who are really ill and their digestive system is really compromised, we might, we might have to work on improving their gut function before we do any significant detox. Because if they're really constipated, for example, or they've got poor GI function, then we don't want to do something that will pull a lot of toxins out of the fat tissue where they're stored and into the bloodstream. And then that person is not able to eliminate those toxins effectively because their routes of elimination are compromised. And that's actually a mistake that I see both you know, the general public and sometimes practitioners making is being too aggressive with pulling toxins out and not attending enough initially to making sure the routes of elimination are optimized because then you can make a, a, a problem much worse actually than it, than it was when the, the toxins are stored in the fat tissue. That's one of the things the body does to try to protect itself against the negative impacts of toxins is storing them in the fat tissue. It doesn't mean that they're not harmful there, but they're perhaps less harmful than they are when the toxins are in the blood and they can cross the blood brain barrier and, you know, cause a lot more damage. So if you pull them out of the fat, bring them into the blood, and then there's nowhere for them to go, you, you will make the problem worse than it was before you started. So it's not something that is free of, of any risk. And I, generally recommend that people do detox and if they're going to do a, a you know a significant detox protocol they do it under the supervision of a provider for that reason got it that's so interesting my brother had a situation like that where i think his gut is pretty compromised but he was going very aggressively to ozone therapy and the breakout all over his body i've never seen anything like it and neither had the yeah. ozone place you know they were really right. unprepared and that was my conclusion was you do not have the other <laughs> systems in place to thoroughly get this out so it's trying every which way to escape and it's been stored for a long time in your tissue and it's just coming out of your skin and you know some die off and things like that when you're you know, getting rid of some harmful microbes, I think is good or seen as fine. But, you know, a lot of the functional medicine doctors and stuff that he's, he talked to said, don't keep at it like this. Like you can't, your body yeah. is not handling it properly. So that was interesting. That's, it's a very important point. So I want to just kind of reiterate it is um, there's no award for going fast with detox. And often fast is, is not good because it will overwhelm the, the compromised detox um, capacity. And, and so, you know, it's sort of like the tortoise and the hare, um, that low and slow is our mantra generally when it comes to detox protocols. Um, and that can be challenging. You know, I think even it, this is not just an American mentality, maybe it's more notable here, but, you know, we tend to want to do things fast and, and, if some is good, then more is better, you know, that that's the kind of mentality. And um, that really tends to backfire with detox protocols. So um, taking it slowly, it's not a good thing to push through, even if you're capable, like you have the willpower to push through difficult reactions. We always advise our patients not to do that because those reactions are your body telling you that it's kind of at its capacity or over or beyond its capacity to deal with that. So you have to wait until those subside and then slowly, you know, proceed again. Then you have another reaction, you back off a little bit. It requires a lot of modulation and patience for sure. Got it. I'm glad you mentioned that um, because I certainly wouldn't want anybody to think, oh, I'm so toxic. Like all the things he's talked about, I haven't been doing. I'm just going to like yeah. do it aggressively this whole week, you know, whatever, and then have some sort of adverse reaction. So yeah, low and slow. So on that topic, uh, I've had mild Hashimoto's for a long time and I've gotten it to like almost subclinical, but um the naturopath that I saw recommended infrared saunas as uh, weekly as a way that I could, you know, try to really get the antibodies to zero. Um, and I asked her, you know, why that method versus another one? And, you know, she kind of 
didn't have time to, to answer my full question. So I think that's what I was referencing, you know, are there certain detox methods that are better for certain conditions and certain uh, toxins, which you talked about certainly with the different metals and mold and things like that. But can you talk a bit more about, you know, research or, you know, anything else that you know that supports the effectiveness or doesn't support the effectiveness as um, of infrared saunas for detoxing in general, but especially for mm -hmm. thyroid conditions? I haven't seen a lot of research specifically for thyroid conditions, but if you, if you understand the mechanisms of how sauna benefits people, then it makes sense that it, it definitely could help with thyroid condition, especially if the thyroid condition is autoimmune. So sauna has a general hormetic benefit that's similar to exercise and fasting. A hormetic stressor is something that, that causes stress on the body, but leads to a positive adaptation to that stress. And that's exercise. So if you think of like lifting weights and you lift a weight, you do bicep curls until you can't lift that weight anymore. You're, you're breaking down muscle fibers when you do that. And that's stressful on the, for the body, but then the body will respond by building that muscle back a little bit stronger than it was before. So it can deal with that, you know, burden or challenge the next time you lift weights. That's that positive adaptation. Um, and fasting works in the same way. And, and so sauna is in that, in that category. But there are also specific mechanisms um, like the expression of heat shock proteins and those play a, a prominent role in a lot of different cellular processes and a, and a really important role in immune function, which would, of course would come into play with Hashimoto's or any other autoimmune disease. You have uh, NERF2, which is a transcription factor uh, it's cytoprotective, antioxidant, and anti-inflammatory, and heat exposure activates NERF2. You have FOXO3, which is another transcriptional regulator, uh, which affects genes related to lifespan and aging, repairs DNA, protects stem cells, and heat exposure has been shown to induce FOXO3. You have with near-infrared versus instead of just like a classic finished dry sauna, you add additional benefits like photobiomodulation, which is the effect that certain wavelengths of light have on our physiology. And uh, many wavelengths in the red spectrum, like 600 to 700 nanometers, and the near-infrared spectrum, which is 770 to 1200 nanometers, have they basically impact tiny receptors called uh, chromophores, which absorb that light. And then that leads to a whole bunch of, uh, of other specific benefits like improving mitochondrial function, increasing microcirculation, which is important for detoxification. You know, the, the studies on, on sauna use show that they uh, stimulate and regulate immune function, they reduce oxidative stress, reduce inflammation. So almost all chronic, uh, modern chronic diseases are inflammatory and they involve oxidative stress. And they improve detoxification, of course, which we've been talking about all along. They have cardiovascular benefits. In fact, there was a pretty famous study now that was done in 2015 in Finland, which is kind of the, the world home of sauna, <laughs> world capital of sauna use. Lots of houses there just have saunas. Uh, it's pretty typical and it's part of the culture. And they found that people who use sauna three to five days a week had a hugely lower risk of cardiovascular disease and overall risk of death. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember that they were far, far greater than like what you could obt obtain with statin use, for example, you know, reducing heart disease risk. They, they found increased exercise tolerance, increased cardiac output, um, lowered markers of oxidative stress, improved lipid profiles, like to lower total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol after three weeks decrease in blood pressure, which was very important. So one of the uh, uh, mechanisms of sauna is it increases nitric oxide production and nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So it makes our blood vessels uh, wider and able to carry more blood. So that lowers the number of, heart, of beats uh, we, we, our heart needs to do to pump the same amount of blood and it lowers the pressure inside of the vessel. So there was a study that showed that sauna use just twice weekly for three months decreased blood pressure in men with hypertension from 166 over 101 to 143 over 92, which is a result similar to what you could get from taking blood pressure medication or perhaps even better. 
And then sauna has also been shown to improve uh, endurance, exercise tolerance, and a bunch of other cardiovascular measures related to fitness and, and exercise. So there's actually quite a lot of research now um, showing the benefits of sauna for lots of different chronic conditions and also the mechanisms for how it works. So even if there aren't specific studies for certain conditions, if you understand the mechanisms of those conditions and then you understand the mechanisms of sauna, you can make an assumption at least that there would be benefit for those conditions as well. Yeah. Wow. It sounds like there's a ton of research and I thought that was all really interesting, um, especially the the Finland one. Um, I always just thought it was because it was so dark and cold there, but um, it sounds like they really understand the <laughs> health benefits as well. So I have two questions before I let you go. Uh, one is, are there any other methods of detoxification that you think or you've heard go too far besides kind of like, you know, too fast and too aggressive as far as use? Are there any that, you know, people pop culture has decided is is a way that we should be detoxifying and in fact it can be harmful or that you don't recommend yeah i mean i think um certain compounds or, or you know food uh, um, supplements chemicals uh that people use to detox can can be um, dangerous if they're not used properly and those are not necessarily just drugs it could also be natural uh, substances so for example um, chlorella and cilantro um, can uh, in some cases i think it, especially if the detox routes are not uh, optimized you know the, the urine feces and stool and you pull toxins out of the fat tissue and you're and you're taking um, chlorella and cilantro they may help those toxins cross the blood brain barrier. That's obviously not desirable. You know, you have, I think situations where, uh, you know, some people are doing like daily colonics or daily coffee enemas. You know, there's not a lot of good research on either of those and the long-term effects of doing those daily, but I think that that can be stressful on the system and, and may have a negative impact on the gut uh, microbiome if, if they're done too regularly. You know, certain, Medications like DMPS, uh, which have been used for detoxification by some practitioners, can be dangerous if they're not used properly. Um, you know, DMSA is a little bit safer, but also can be can be overdone. One of the reasons I tend to focus on the basics in you know when I'm talking to the general public is because a I think it, they, I I really do think those are the most important thing, and b detox protocols can be tricky and, and bad stuff can happen. And so like, especially if you're using, you know, lots of different supplements and it's, it is possible to cause harm. So just, you know, proceed with caution or find someone to work with that's experienced in doing these protocols. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yes. I've heard a lot of conflicting things about colonics and coffee enemas and have you know, almost at one point decided to give coffee enemas a try and then kind of just decided to go back to the basics and really do the, the everyday things well and do the botanicals, you know, get those in there. And um, they, it could turn out that some research is done in the future that shows us that they aren't harmful, but I'm always kind of, um, you know, I like to wait until we, <laughs> until we can see that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just there's not really much research. Anecdotally, some people have done really well with coffee enemas, so I'm not saying that they can't play some role, but you know, you asked like, what are some of the pitfalls? And I think I, I've seen people go, what I think it might be a bit overboard with that, you know, doing them twice a day for an extended period of time. And I think that there could be some downsides there. Right, okay. Well, thank you so much for this. My last question, which you probably um, are expecting at this point is how do you detox? And also, you know, ties into the final question I have for you, which I ask all of the Wellbe experts, which is how do you hashtag get Wellbe since that's our, you know, social channels and our website and everything is getwellbe.com. So you can list potentially some of the ways that you detox yourself um, or otherwise, you know, it can be just something that you do every single day without which you're, you feel like your whole 
idea of personal wellness is off or it can be a few things or what, you know, whatever comes to mind. Yeah. So for detox, I get well be by focusing on the basics. I don't really um, have a need mostly for doing additional stuff beyond that. I do actually have a, a near infrared sauna um, that I love to use. My usage varies depending on the time of year and what else is going on in my life, but I use it not just for detox, but for just general health and wellness. I think it's one of the best things we can do to ex extend our health span along with exercise, fasting, good diet, et cetera. And I test myself because I'm a clinician. So I, I know how to test myself to, to check my toxic burden. And fortunately it's low. As a practitioner, what are some of the ways that someone can test um, if, if somebody were your patient to see how they are doing on their toxic burden? There are lots of different tests uh, depending on what toxins you're looking for. So there, there are tests for heavy metals um, and you can test the blood, you can test the hair, you can test the urine. Uh, we usually do a combination of all of those to get the best data. If you're testing for persistent organic pollutants, um, like herbicides, pesticides, BPA, uh, glyphosate, perchlorate, industrial compounds that you, you know, are found in jet fuel and flame retardants and all the good stuff that we're exposed to these days. Um, urine is typically the best route, uh, the best body fluid to test for that. And, and like Great Plains Lab and Doctors Data have uh, tests that will, that will screen for those compounds. For mold and other biotoxins that you encounter in an indoor building, um, you, you can test the buildings, you know, for those toxins. You can also um, test the blood for certain inflammatory markers and other neuroregulatory markers that will tend to be off and out of range when someone is being affected by those kinds of toxins. And there are also urine mycotoxin tests, which I have some doubts uh, about their validity, but um, those are out there as well. So it really depends on the types of toxins that you're testing for, but those are kind of the three main categories that we tend to work with in, in practice. Okay, that's very helpful. So if somebody is thinking they might have a high toxic burden or just be curious, they can look into some of those tests or look into uh, you know, functional medicine practitioners that might offer those tests. So thank you for that. Exactly. And in terms of general health, I get well be by being consistent with my meditation practice on a daily basis and by uh, exercising outdoors almost every day. Um, every day is the goal. It doesn't always happen, but getting outside and you know, at this time of year, it's, it's mountain biking, hiking, stand up paddle boarding, kayaking are the, are the mainstays. And then during the winter, it's uh, skiing. Uh, doing some activity outdoors is really my, my best medicine. Well, that's awesome. And your life in the mountains sounds spectacular. You're making me very jealous. Although I live somewhere where I can go kayaking tonight. So I think I'm going to make a point to do that just because you said that. All right, Chris. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me today to talk about this topic. You are a wealth of knowledge. Um, and I thought you just had a couple of great points about you know, how you advise patients, but also obviously contributing to a lot of our understanding of the research behind different detoxification methods and, and obviously tying in your focus on uh, ancestral health and the hunter-gatherer lifestyle with how much we are not having that today and how much chronic disease we are having as a result. So I think this is incredibly empowering and you know, my platform and mission is all dedicated to people's health empowerment. So a lot of the stuff people listening can start doing you know, the second they finish listening. And I love that we were able to talk about a mix of both the things that are totally free and the things that are a little bit more advanced that you might wanna access um, with a practitioner if you think there's a reason to. So thank you very much again and uh, have a great day. Thank you, it was a pleasure, appreciate the invitation.